now, Lord, may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the greatest commercials that I have ever seen uh, went something like this. Um, there, it's, the scene opens in a hospital operation room. Uh, the doctor, the lead doctor, they're all wearing surgical masks, uh, steps back and he says, okay, folks, sew, sew him up. And he removes the mask. And one of the, doctor, the other doctors looks at him and says, wait a second, you're not Dr. Stewart. And he just says, no. And he turns and just before he walks out the door, he says, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Oh, that's such a better commercial than what your reaction is. <laughs> then the title, the title um, uh, scene comes and it's Holiday Inn Express. Um, it'll make you feel smarter or something like that. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> we, uh, we started into a series about, uh, I think about three weeks ago, where we are going through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we see it in Matthew uh, chapter 5 through 7, and it's Jesus' most expansive, comprehensive teachings. And he, uh, these are teachings about the kingdom of God. In fact, in almost every section, you'll see this phrase, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven coming back. And we see that Jesus is really teaching us the ways of the kingdom. How do we walk in the way of God? How do we how do we be people who follow God? How do we do that? That's what this series is about. Now, today, I, I had fully intended on handling verses 17 through 48, because there's some similarities in there where Jesus would, will say in, in each of those sections, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Um, but there's just so much good things in there that I did, could not find a way to handle that in any way that was helpful in one big chunk. So we're going to take it uh, piece by piece. Uh, it's going to add maybe a few weeks to the uh, to this whole sermon series, but I've got you every morning, every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock anyway, so why not, right? No, it's more than that. There's so much in here that is worthy of us paying a little bit more attention to than just skimming across the surface. Um, at, it, it's important for us to understand now Jesus starts to get into the real the, the real content of this Sermon on the Mount, um, it's important for us to understand in the weeks that come that at some points, Jesus' teachings, they affirm our deepest desires and our greatest longings. But at some points, these teachings of Jesus cut straight to the heart. And not unlike a doctor, his words uh, can wound us like a doctor would at his patients say it this way, his words can wound us much like a doctor wounds his patients in order to operate and to heal them. Some things are deep enough that you have to cut to get in there and heal. And sometimes the way Jesus speaks comes across like that, like, ouch. But then you realize, oh no, I'm actually better off for having heard this from Jesus, from having read this here. Um, and but whether or not in the moment his hands either affirm us or wound us, the point is we have to trust him because they are his hands. Anything that Jesus teaches, anything that he says, he does it to bring us into the life, the, the full life or the abundant life that we were created for. Um, it's an important thing to remember and to hold in front of us as we move through this. So Jesus begins in his sermon here and immediately he's establishing his credibility um, he's, uh, he's presented himself as a teacher of the scriptures, and a lot of the things he says, they are new and even uh, refreshing. What really gets radical is the word that Mark used. I think it's a good word. Uh, what really gets radical is that some of the things that Jesus said, maybe the majority of things that Jesus said, seem to contradict the religious professionals of his day. Yes, those religious professionals, my colleagues, uh, Jesus has some of his most biting, uh, sharp words for the guild of biblical scholarship, if you will. And it, this is no different 
here. In fact, in many times, Jesus was speaking with such like an authority, such like, I know that this is true and it goes against some of what you're saying, um, that these religious professionals would question Jesus. On what authority does he speak? Have you read the Chronicles of Narnia? I probably mentioned this a couple times. Please read the Chronicles of Narnia. Like add that, you all have a summer reading list and the Chronicles of Narnia is right there. They're written for children, but man, they're good. Um, reread them if, you have, if you've read them once before. There's this awesome scene in the very first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I know you've heard of this, uh, where uh, here is Aslan, the, the, the lion, the king, uh, a type of Christ. He's there in the camp with all of the free peoples of Narnia who resist the, the, the witch that brought winter and never Christmas. And, uh, and this white witch comes into the camp now, and she comes for the purpose of accusing the traitor Edmund, a son of Adam, a boy who had committed treason against Aslan himself and against his brother and sisters. And this witch stands before Aslan, and the whole crowd of, of Narnians are, are there, and they're listening. And uh, the witch says to Aslan, she starts quoting what they called the deep magic. It was their ancient law. She's quoting this and she says, Aslan, you know that the deep magic requires that, we d that a traitor be handled like this. And almost before she gets the words out completely out of her mouth, Aslan, this great lion, bigger than any lion we've ever seen, lets out this huge roar. And he says to her, do not quote the deep magic to me, which I was there when it was written. Mic drop, like Narnians cheering. It, it, what a powerful moment. Sometimes when I read the interaction between the religious professionals and Jesus, I'm, I wish he would have said that line. Don't quote the law to me. I was there when it was written. He was there when it was written. He doesn't say those exact words, but he does uh, answer, um, uh, uh, he does answer back in a lot of these ways. He didn't come to bring a, a, a new teaching or a reinterpretation of the old. That was the question. He's saying, no, I actually came to bring you back to the heart of what it was all about from the first place. Uh, look at this in, uh, again in Matthew uh, 5, 17 and 18. Don't think uh, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. It's not a new thing. It's a really old thing that he's bringing us back to the heart of, of everything that was there right from the beginning. Jesus is continuing what God started way back with Adam and then to Noah, and then to Abraham, and then to Moses, and then on to David. And finally, Jesus is saying, this is the final stage of this thing that has been happening since the very beginning, since the Garden of Eden. I haven't come to lead you on a different path. I've come to lead you further up the path that the Father laid out for, for humanity right from the beginning. Uh, the religious professionals, though, they were not a fan of this teaching, and you'll see why. They had added many teachings to the scriptures in order to help explain them, in order to uh, 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 protect people from doing the wrong things, if we're being generous uh, in assuming their in in intentions. But they had drifted away, not so much from the letter of the law, but from the spirit of the law, the why behind it. The, the, the thing that the heartbeat of the father in when he gave uh, commands. Uh, so they questioned his authority. They didn't like what he was doing. And then in Matthew chapter five, verse 19 and 20, he says uh, this. Um, pay no attention. There we go. He says uh, in verse 19, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that 
of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious professionals, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. That's equivalent to I was there when it was written. It's sharp. Your righteousness has to be better than those guys right there. Uh, he, it, this was at once a critique of the religious professionals and a high call for everyone else. Jesus is saying, and everybody there understood it, these guys are missing the point. These scribes and Pharisees, these religious professionals, they're getting it, they, or they're missing it. They, they aren't getting it. They have seen the letter of the law, but they have completely abandoned the heart behind it, and they've just added on top of more and more things. Um, and, and I can just imagine... Just imagine Jesus' disciples sitting there and Jesus saying that your righteousness has to be better than these guys. And the disciples going, did he just say that? Did, did, he, did he say that out loud? I mean, we we're all thinking it. We we're all kind of hoping it, but he finally said it. it. You know, they want us to be, they call themselves our shepherds and we're their sheep, but they just keep adding a burden on top of a burden on top of a burden. Uh, thank God that Jesus just said what we all were hoping was true but then jesus did say something else he said unless your righteousness is better than their righteousness you'll never enter into the kingdom of heaven righteousness no, and not just a righteousness that's like theirs a, a truer righteousness a better righteousness righteous uh, righteous and righteousness is one of those world words that's so big, um, so, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe vague even. It's almost like it comes from another world and that that world is a place we can't get to. Um, righteous, though, uh, I just invite you to think of righteousness like this. It's simply living your life according to the heart and ways and will of God. Righteousness, living according not only to the ways of God, the laws of God, but according to the heart, the ways, and the will of God. It's conformity to God's sovereign plan. A righteous act would be an act that is in line with the heart, ways, and will of God. A righteous person is one whose life completely and absolutely conforms to the heart, ways, and will of God. It's, I mentioned David to you earlier. Um, he was the the, the second king of Israel, the first great king of Israel. Um, and this in David's days, it was like the preamble to the glory days of the kingdom of Israel. But David was a poet and a singer. And he, in thinking about righteousness and talking about righteousness, he says it like this. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? This is Psalm 24. Uh, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, and who has sw not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him who seek the face of the God of Jacob. So who can come into the presence of God? Who, how do you get into this kingdom, in other words? Uh, who may ascend the hill of the Lord and stand before him, clean hands, and pure heart. Notice those two things together, clean hands and a pure heart. It's not just clean hands, the outward acts of righteousness. And it's also not just a pure heart, uh, righteous intentions. It is the two together, clean hands and a pure heart. And the problem in Jesus' day was that the religious professionals put so much emphasis on one at the expense of the other. So much emphasis on the clean hands and so little or no emphasis on the clean, the pure heart. It's like this. If you tell your kid to uh, go make their, their beds and, you know, five minutes later they come back downstairs. I made my bed. You go up to check it because you've learned better than just to take their word. You go up and check it and the bed's made, but there's a pile of dirty clothes on top. And then you say, this isn't done. They said, what? I did what you told me to do. It's a common experience, right? Yes, you did what I told you to do, but you didn't understand the instruction. There's a, there's a difference there that can be hard to teach kids in the beginning. Um, that if I say this, I really mean this. It's still the same instruction, but it's understanding the heart 
of the instruction. Um, Jesus says to uh, his disciples and to you and me, your righteousness has to go further than that. Yes, obey the commands of God, clean hands. They are for your life and blessing, but don't treat them as if the outward acts are the bare minimum that you have to do to, for, to, to satisfy the God of heaven. Made your bed, but there's still a bunch of junk on top of it. Um, it your righteousness has to be better. It has to go deeper. It has to be clean hands and a pure heart. And that this is the only way into the kingdom of God, Jesus says. Righteousness has always been the way into the kingdom of God. This isn't a new teaching of Jesus. It has always been the way. The aim has always been righteousness, and the problem has always been with our hearts. But the problem we think we have is not the problem we actually have. Um, when, you, when I'm talking about righteous, maybe you're hearing it right now. Um, maybe I, if I'm saying these words of Jesus, your righteousness has to be better, perhaps you're thinking of holier than thou types. You know what I mean by holier than thou? Like, <laughs> I'm righteous. You're not. You should be like me. Not that very many people go around saying that, but you know the attitude. Uh, sometimes we think, oh, I should be righteous. And we think, well, I don't want to be like that. Sometimes we think, well, actually, I'm not that religious. Um, isn't it just enough to, um, uh, to be a good person? Uh, isn't it enough to just, you know, try to do the right thing at the right time and, and, and to, to be kind to people? And then, you know what, even to go to church uh, as often as you logistically can make it work. Isn't that enough? Um, you know what? The religious professionals of Jesus' day and of our day uh, would probably agree with you. Yeah, yeah, that, that kind of righteousness, that clean hands only type of righteousness, that's great. But you know what the problem is? No matter what you do, they're always going to say you have to do more. Clean hands. Yeah, outward acts, be kind, do good things, uh, but do more. And no matter how much you do, you're going to have to do more because if that's where righteousness is, if righteousness only lies in the hands, then I'm constantly having to put more things into my hands. It's never satisfied. I can never do enough to be righteous if it only lies in the hands. Um, and this, I, I'm convinced that this is one of the reasons so many in our day avoid church, avoid religion, is because this is the type of righteousness that one way or the other we have been communicating, that righteousness only lies in the hands. And so, you know what? You're probably not doing enough. So you should do more. Right. You should. You know what? It's great that you're coming once a month. You really should be coming twice a month. Or it's great that you are helping out at the food pantry. You should also be helping out at the homeless shelter. It's always one more thing. And after a while, the soul gets tired of one more thing after one more thing. This is not the type of righteousness that Jesus is saying is the better righteousness. It's not the clean hands only righteousness. It's the clean hands, pure heart. But we see that model of righteousness and we think, man, I don't want that. Why would I, I'm just talking about not in the metaphorical eye, me personally, Chris Green, why would I want to show up at a place where I'm constantly told that what I'm doing isn't enough, that, that, that I need to keep doing more, and that the only way I can earn my way into heaven is by making sure that I'm just stacking good deed on top of good deed and showing up for church in a while. And uh, ugh. I, I, That's how I feel. I don't want that. That, that doesn't seem true. That doesn't seem consistent with what I read here. But we would be mistaken to think that righteousness, therefore, is nothing that we actually need or want. We want righteousness. Deep within us, we want righteousness, but we want a righteousness that can be traced from the hands to the heart. An authentic righteousness, a, a true righteousness. And this was Jesus' whole point. He did not say, I want you to look more righteous than those guys, than the religious professionals. He says, I want you to understand that it's clean hands and pure heart, that it goes deeper than just the letter on the page, that it goes into the inclinations and intentions of our hearts. A better righteousness lies both in the hands and in the heart. But let's get real. We all here today, we, we probably all have good hearts. In the South, that was always a, 
I don't know. They met, they met it. Sometimes it was like, oh, bless his heart. Bless your heart. You ever hear that? Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Sometimes that was said when they, someone did something real stupid. Oh, bless his heart. It's not, I don't know why that jumped into my mind. I just thought, oh, bless your heart. We, we treat, we, we might have good blessed hearts, but pure hearts. Can any one of us truly say, um, I have a pure heart? Um, the minute you say it, you're probably lying because then therefore your pure heart is gone anyway. Um, we are uh, prone to wander, as uh, the, the hymnist said, prone to wander. Um, we have a big problem. Jesus is saying pure, clean hands, pure heart. Righteousness has to be better than the Pharisees. And yet here we are and our righteous, if we're honest, we're no better than the religious professionals of Jesus's day are, or ours. So are we damned to be lesser uh, while Jesus demands that we be better? In uh, Romans chapter three, and I'm closing here, Paul answers this question this way. First, he explains the situation. He says, uh, this is chapter three, verse nine. What then, are we any better off? Not at all, for we've already charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. That's the whole world right there. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. He's explaining that this is not a new situation. Since the days of Adam, this has been the case. But then he comes in and hope uh, starts coming in in verse 21. He says this, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. Again, not abolishing what was done before, fulfilling them. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The righteousness for which we long, the one that goes all the way from the hands to the hearts is the one that comes by faith in Jesus Christ, by trusting him enough to walk in the way that he laid out for us and explained for us. Uh, when we profess faith in Jesus Christ and devote ourselves to walking in that way, the scriptures make clear that God himself comes into our hearts and begins to do the purifying heart work on the inside as we walk with him. So you see, the religious, uh, all the religious professionals like myself, we all face the temptation to uh, lead you to believe that we are the professionals that you need. In reality, the only qualifications we have for the surgery on your heart that's necessary is uh, that we stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night. We have no qualifications to do that type of heart work. Um, your righteousness must be better than that. And so your heart needs a better doctor. Let's ask him now to do together um, that work that only he can do. Lord, we trust you as um, patients must trust their doctors. So Lord, we trust you. We ask you, Lord, to leave us unsatisfied with any kind of righteousness that only goes skin deep, but to teach us a righteousness that lies both in the hands and in the heart, to follow your commands all the way through to your desire. I pray, God, that as we walk this path, that you would be our guiding light, that you would make our steps sure, that you would give us vision to see the path that lies ahead, and that you give us the courage and the faith the trust to walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen.